Boston, home to the Big Dig, one of the largest, most technically challenging and expensive public works projects in American history. When it's complete, it'll have cost nearly $15 billion, taken 20 years, and changed the face of one of America's oldest cities. It's a collection of uh, mega projects. It's like, it's like a mega, mega project. But the Big Dig is more than a giant construction project. This is a story of dogged determination and the sheer audacity to think the unthinkable. But the engineers will make mistakes. I can assure everybody that there is not a three foot nine gap in the Ted Williams tunnel. They will narrowly avoid disaster. To this day, we still don't know exactly what happened. And they will go head to head with the local community. I don't want anything from you except what is due me, and that is eight hours sleep a night. Boston lies on the east coast of America and is the capital city of the state of Massachusetts. Boston is one of America's oldest cities, built long before the age of the car. In 1692, it was the wealthiest town in the American colonies. In 1776, the city was liberated from the British, and by 1875, 340,000 people lived in this thriving metropolis. But by the early 20th century, motorized traffic is crowding the city's narrow streets. By the 1950s, the car is strangling the city. A solution has to be found. Over the next decade, Boston is brutally redeveloped. A network of new roads is built through the heart of residential areas, displacing 20,000 people. The main feature of this so-called progress is an elevated six-lane expressway that rips its way through the heart of Boston. A structure like that was considered to be a sexy thing. Cars are up in the sky, people are down on the ground. With the logic that you could drive into the city on this elevated expressway, and you could drive off the ramps, park directly below it, and walk to your job. It effectively cuts the city in half, creating a dank, dark, and dirty space beneath it. And it doesn't even solve the traffic problems. By the 1960s, this highway in the sky is carrying its design capacity of 75,000 vehicles a day. By the 1980s, 200,000 cars and trucks congest central Boston each day. And the artery is jammed up to 14 hours of every 24. 613 WBC's traffic on the threes with Steve Scalish and what's new now? Well, nothing new really. It's just miserable out there. In fact, this has been a continuous rush hours from the morning all the way through to now. It just hasn't let up. It's an unmitigated disaster. But help is at hand. Fred Salvucci, a graduate from MIT, works for the Boston Redevelopment Authority. He is vehemently anti-highways and is searching for a way to solve the problem. Over the coming months and years, Salvucci develops a plan to redesign the city's transportation network. The idea is to connect the airport with South Boston by digging a tunnel under the harbor and continuing that tunnel through to I-90, the interstate highway heading west. Also, to remove the elevated roadway and tunnel directly underneath the downtown area, replacing the existing bridge over the Charles River with a new one. It is dubbed the Big Dig. In terms of its scale, the Big Dig is one of the largest civil engineering challenges ever undertaken in the US. In terms of its technical complexity, some say it's the equivalent of putting a man on the moon. In terms of its budget, it is estimated to cost a colossal $2.6 billion. In 1975, Fred Salvucci becomes Secretary for Transportation for the state of Massachusetts. Motivated by a desire not to repeat the mistakes of the past, he begins to sell the idea of the Big Dig to the people of Boston. 
It does not have any negative impacts on the community, so we think this is a real win-win situation. Over the coming years, Salvucci and his disciples spread the word. Having secured public support, he travels to Washington for federal funding. But the idea is initially ridiculed. By the mid-80s, Salvucci is still fighting for funding. President Reagan repeatedly attempts to block the big dig. The bill's a textbook example of special interest pork borough politics at work, and I have no choice but to veto it. Reagan vetoing this thing uh, was outrageous. Uh, we were absolutely entitled. Uh, we are part of the United States of America. We had paid our taxes. We had a right to use federal funds to improve our city as other regions had done. But Salvucci, determined to see his project happen, doesn't give up the fight. In April 1987, funding is finally won in Congress by a single vote. Since its conception, the Big Dig has taken 16 years to gain federal funding. In a, a victory for perseverance. <laughs> With funding secured, construction gets underway, and the real problems begin. With federal funding secured, the Boston Big Dig, one of the most technically challenging and expensive megastructures in American history, gets underway. This awesome challenge can be separated into four elements. Number one, build a tunnel under the harbor connecting the airport to the city. Number two, continue the tunnel under South Boston and the Fort Point Channel, connecting it with the Interstate Highway I-90. Number three, tunnel directly through the downtown area to create an eight-lane state-of-the-art underground highway. Finally, replace the existing crossing over the Charles River with the widest cable-stayed bridge in the world. After a decade on the drawing board, the estimated budget is more than doubled, from its original $2.6 billion to $5.8 billion. But on December the 19th, 1991, the Big Dig breaks ground, tunneling across Boston Harbor. A super scoop, the world's largest marine excavator, digs a trench three-quarters of a mile long between Logan International Airport and the South Boston waterfront. 890,000 cubic yards of rock and mud, enough to fill a sports stadium twice, is removed from the harbor floor and unceremoniously dumped on an island in the harbor. Once complete, this enormous trench will house 12 steel tunnel sections. 400 miles and five states south in Baltimore, Maryland, the steel tunnel sections are being built. Each one weighs 33,000 tons, is 325 feet long, 40 feet high, and 80 feet wide. When complete, all 12 are floated up the coast to Boston. We were very, very expectant, uh, like parents almost, waiting for the first uh, the firstborn to arrive. The uh, Marine fleet actually welcomed it with fireboats uh, pumping water around it, and it was just thrilling to see the product of so much engineering and fabrication work being brought into the harbor like a grand entrance. Once in South Boston, each steel tunnel component is docked at a shipping terminal and outfitted with four concrete reinforced lanes. Two for eastbound traffic, two for westbound traffic. Once the work is complete, the sections are floated out into Boston Harbor by a massive barge until they lie exactly over the trench. Concrete is poured into each section 
so that it gently sinks into the trench, where it is connected to the rest of the tunnel. It's a nail-biting maneuver, with less than one inch of room for error. It went uh, very predictably. The result of a job looking easy and going well is good planning. Uh, every large job should be planned uh, at least twice uh, to make sure that you've covered all the bases. But they didn't cover all the bases. The tunnel is three feet, nine inches short. And I remember the, the, the day that this occurred and the engineering manager at the time um, came into the project director's office, to Peter Zook's office, because he needed to tell him that we had this, this discrepancy, of three feet nine. And I remember Peter, Peter Zook at the time telling the engineering manager in a very nonplussed way, he said, Tony, there's an old adage, measure twice, cut once. It's a glaring error and not a great start to the project, but the engineers take it in their stride. The solution is to extend the land-based tunnel on the South Boston side to meet the shortfall. So the obvious answer was just extend the cut and cover tunnel from the land to meet the immersed tube tunnel. Uh, I can assure everybody that there is not a three foot nine gap in the Ted Williams tunnel. On December the 15th, 1995, the tunnel is finished, named after Boston's baseball hero, Ted the Kid Williams. This element of the big dig is complete. Now the Ted Williams Tunnel must be connected to the existing interstate highway I-90. But instead of building a six-lane eyesore across South Boston, the team, learning from the mistakes of the past, go for the more costly option of tunneling their way through. Fred Salvucci, the father of the Big Dig, is vehemently anti-highway and he is adamant that the project will disrupt the city as little as possible. It was Fred Salvucci's passionate feeling that no residential property would be taken, no person would be dislodged from their home in order to build this project. But to go underground presents a major headache for the engineers. Lying directly in the path of the tunnel is the Fort Point Channel, a vast unused shipping basin once the site of the Boston Tea Party. This is the stage in the build the team have been dreading. The problem is that the space available for construction is extremely tight. On one side is the factory of a major company, and on the other, the US Postal Service. Neither can be disturbed. In the only space available, the team decide to dig a huge construction pit known as a casting basin. It'll be 1,100 feet long, 300 feet wide, and 60 feet deep. So large, you could dock three Titanics in it. Well, right now we're in the, we're in the center of the uh, old casting basin site, a restored surface now on the edge of Four Point Channel. There was no place in the city of Boston more active than Four Point Channel during peak construction from 97 to 2001. It was a beehive of activity. You saw more crane booms in the air. In fact, sometimes you could try to look across the channel and you couldn't even see the other side. The end of the casting basin opens onto Fort Point Channel, but is sealed off by a temporary dam. Inside the casting basin, they will construct six concrete tunnel sections to cross the channel. Once built, the team will remove the temporary dam, flood the basin, and float the tunnel sections out into the Fort Point channel and place them in position. It's as ambitious as it is costly, there's no alternative. This is the linchpin to the entire project. A problem here will delay connecting the tunnel to Interstate 90 and have a massive impact on the schedule and the budget. To up the stakes once more, the team confront the next major problem. 
Boston has America's oldest subway system. Running across Fort Point Channel is the Red Line. The Red Line is made up of two aging tunnels built during the First World War. They lie just 26 feet beneath the bottom of the channel. The Big Dick's tunnel has to go across the bottom of the channel, but over the Red Line. The team must devise a way of laying six concrete tunnel boxes just four feet above the subway without crushing it. One section alone weighs more than 50,000 tons. To add to the problem, the red line will continue to operate throughout the entire construction, carrying 218,000 commuters every day. A collapse in the subway walls would result in the death of thousands and the flooding of the whole of downtown Boston. And at just at that time um, is when Chicago experienced probably one of the greater um, municipal disasters in this country's history. A construction team driving piles beneath the Chicago River accidentally pierce a network of freight tunnels that run 40 feet beneath the streets of Chicago. 200 million gallons of river water pours into the tunnel system before reaching equilibrium. Basements are flooded, knocking out electric and natural gas services, and the subway is disrupted for a month. It costs the city $50 million in compensation alone. The Big Dig team are about to attempt a similar operation. But this time, if things go badly wrong, it won't be a river that comes flooding in, but the Atlantic Ocean. With the Chicago disaster in mind, the team knows that what they're about to attempt is the most dangerous and difficult part of the entire build. They plan the Fort Point Channel Tunnel crossing in minute detail and with the utmost care. One of our difficult factors below the channel is that there is an existing red line subway system which was built in 1914. We had to excavate out in the bottom of the channel to within only four foot of the existing red line subway tunnels. The team then build 110 concrete foundations surrounding the red line. Each one is sunk 145 feet into solid bedrock. These will support the tunnel as it goes over the subway line. Each section is floated into the channel, lowered into place on top of the concrete supports, bridging over the subway. Either end, temporary walls are built on top of the tunnel. That allowed us to pump the water down on either side of the immersed tubes to allow us to build the remaining tunnel sections on each end. By June 2001, the last of the six tunnel sections is floated into the Fort Point Channel. With so little room to maneuver, positioning each section has to be carefully choreographed. And it was almost similar to like those uh, the childhood toys when you had to slide all little numbers around and get them in order when, they, when you ended up all mixed up. The tunnel sections are delicately lowered into position. Victory is in sight. Then, in the early hours of the morning on Saturday the 22nd of September 2001, disaster strikes. The tunnel section that meets land on the far side of Fort Point Channel springs a massive leak. A waterproof seal at the bottom of the tunnel has burst. And 70,000 gallons of the Atlantic Ocean starts to pour in every minute. When we got here, it was like nothing I've ever expected. The amount of water we had coming in was, it was demoralizing. It was incredible how much water we had coming in. I thought we could handle about anything that came at us and uh, we, Mother Nature kicked, kicked our butts. 
With one side of the immersed tunnel rapidly filling with water, it creates an imbalance of pressure. If left unchecked, it has the potential to dislodge the tunnel sections from their foundations. If one section, weighing as much as a battleship, falls on the red line, it would spell disaster for the project and the city of Boston. If the tunnel had dislodged, we would flood downtown. Tunnels would come off the caissons. It could go down on the red line and flood the red line. Those would be the two major catastrophes. The team immediately mobilize. They have just minutes to come up with a solution. They decide to open the bulkhead doors between the tunnel sections to deliberately flood the entire tunnel and casting basin to equalize the pressure. It means ruining construction equipment, but there's little choice. And it works. The pressure is relieved, and the tunnel stays in place. That day in September when we uh, flooded the casting basin and had to let the water come all the way across, that was probably the lowest um, the project had ever been. It, it, we were just so close, and uh, it got you know pulled away from us at the last at the last minute. To look up and see the look on all the people's faces who put you know six, seven, eight years of their life, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and to see it washed away, it was uh, very demoralizing. Work doesn't get back into full swing for more than three months. It's a major setback costs an estimated ten million dollars. But it could have been a lot worse. By mid-January 2002, work continues on the tunnel, but they're behind schedule. The estimated budget has increased to 14 billion dollars, and the public's confidence in the project is waning. But the problems are not yet over, not by a long shot. Once over the red line and across Fort Point Channel, the engineers must confront the next major problem. On the west side of the channel is a complex rail network for regional trains serving South Station. The team have to tunnel underneath these tracks without disturbing a single train. The problem is that at this point, the tunnel is only 15 feet below the surface, equivalent to the deep end of a swimming pool. To drive a vast concrete tunnel through the ground, this close to the rail tracks could buckle the ground and dislodge them. Closing down the rail network is not an option. 150,000 commuters use South Station every day. The slightest disturbance could cause a major train derailment. To succeed, the team must be certain that the soil is strong enough to withstand the pressure. And there, lies the next problem. Five years into construction, the Big Dig, one of the largest and most technically challenging and expensive civil engineering projects in the US, is tunneling its way under the city of Boston. Since 1630, Boston has been expanding into the harbor. Today, 70% of the city is built on landfill, a loose mixture of soil, brick, wood, concrete and sand. Below this is another weak layer of blue clay. The team knows that if they tunnel through this landfill so close to the surface, it could collapse around them. They must devise a way of strengthening it. And they come up with an ingenious solution, freezing the soil. There's a whole potpourri of different types of soils in there. Um, nothing was uniform. There was no way to really solidify it, except for someone threw out the idea of, let's freeze it. Hundreds of thin pipes are threaded into the ground around the rail tracks up to a depth of 43 feet. Salt water, chilled to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, is then circulated through the pipes, gradually drawing heat out of the soil 
until it freezes solid. Once the soil is frozen, the team create a vast construction area known as a jacking pit. Inside it, they cast a concrete tunnel in sections. The construction team places the first tunnel section in position and begin tunneling their way into the frozen soil. Once the dirt is excavated, the tunnel section is inched forward into the void of giant hydraulic jacks. The technique known as tunnel jacking is desperately slow. An eight-hour shift moves a section just three feet. In some areas, we were only 15 foot below the surface of the track bed. As we pushed this tunnel structure, the size of a, a high school gymnasium, underneath the, the tracks themselves. Throughout the entire process, 150,000 commuters pass overhead every day and know nothing of what is going on beneath them. It takes 15 months to jack the tunnel until it meets the Interstate 90. In January 2003, the connection is open to the public. Let's give them the round of applause that they deserve for building this project. The tunnel now stretches seamlessly from Logan Airport, under the harbor, through South Boston, under Fort Point Channel, over the Red Line subway, and under the South Station rail tracks to emerge above ground and join I-90, the interstate highway, that continues 3,089 miles to Seattle on the west coast of America. With the new connection, traffic heading for the airport from the south and west of the city no longer goes through the downtown area. For the first time, tangible benefits of a big dig are recognized by the public. With the connection from the airport to Interstate 90 complete, the team turn their attention to replacing the congested elevated roadway that runs through the downtown area. The plan is to tear it down and replace it with an eight-lane tunnel highway under the city in the exact footprint of the raised artery. Road tunneling is nothing new. Traditionally, engineers use a method known as cut and cover. Cut a large trench in the earth and rock, build the tunnel floor and sides, and cover it on top. The problem is that the team cannot tear down the elevated roadway until they have built the tunnel. Closing the city down is obviously not an option. The ability to get traffic into the downtown area is what keeps Boston functioning. The team have to think outside the box. And there are two additional problems. How do you tunnel through landfill without the foundations of high-rise buildings weakening or even collapsing? Another problem is the water table, which in Boston is so high, it'll be more of an underwater tunnel than an underground one. The team comes up with a plan. They will underpin the existing elevated highway, allowing the traffic to continue using it tunnel directly underneath it. It sounds simple, but it isn't. The trick is using a thick liquid known as slurry that is half the density of concrete. Slurry is a mix of volcanic clay and water and is used to stabilize the soil where it's weak or the water table is high. The team need to build a supporting wall that will take the weight of the entire elevated roadway. To do this, they dig a line of trenches. Each one is 10 feet wide, 3 feet thick, and excavated, in some cases, 140 feet down to bedrock. As the weak soil is removed, the cavity is filled with the slurry, which, because of its density, prevents the hole from collapsing. Then, massive steel support beams are placed either end of the trench to reinforce it. 
Eventually, concrete is poured in and the slurry is pumped out. The concrete sets solid and what is left is a reinforced concrete wall. Repeat this process hundreds of times either side of the elevated artery and you have a three mile long supporting wall that not only bears the weight of the entire roadway, but becomes the tunnel walls. There was a jacking system that literally pick up take on the weight of the existing byway. The weight then would be transferred to the new structure and in the end the new structure was now holding all the weight that the old structure used to hold. You cut away the legs and nothing moves. Uh, this was done 68 times all the way through the downtown area for a six-lane elevated highway. In total, the team jack up 552,000 tons of steel and concrete. More than four times the weight of London's Tower Bridge. Throughout the entire process, the heavy traffic above inches forward on the elevated roadway, none the wiser. By now, the Big Dig is in full swing, tunneling its way through the city, directly under the elevated roadway. 5,500 people are employed every day on the project, and payroll and production costs exceed $3 million a day. Construction crews work around the clock, six days a week. 5,000 hard hats are issued every working day. 150 cranes punctuate the skyline. Tunneling through downtown Boston is like being on an archaeological dig. We would be six feet off of a building foundation over here or maybe ten feet off the corner of another building over there. It soon becomes clear where the city limits once lay. We did run across seawalls and wharf pilings and foundations of all types. Occasionally you'd run into, say, porcelain and, and other materials and little bottles and things. The opportunity to dig through one of America's oldest cities sets the real archaeologists scrambling for their trowels. Now housed in the basement of an old police station are boxes of artifacts found in the landfill. Ellen Birkeland is an archaeologist for the city and curator of the collection. This is actually a, a batter bowl. It's sort of the Tupperware, if you will, of the of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Oh, this is this is sweet. This is sweet. This is a tankard, an ale tankard. It's a redware. This is a milk pan to cool milk down quickly. It has a large surface area. Something else that was common to every every household in Boston: a chamber pot. They didn't have indoor plumbing back in the 1600s. <laughs> We have a bone-handled knife, sweet little fork, and part of a metal knife. And of course, the cigarette butt of the 16, 17, 18, 1900s, tobacco pipes. And we find thousands of fragments of white ball clay smoking pipes. It was an opportunity uh, that we'll never see again. Uh, we were able to go in and systematically look at an urban area and carefully excavate the, the past lives of, of those early Bostonians. Back in the present day, the Big Dig team is tunneling its way through the city. By now, modern Bostonians are complaining that the build is taking too long and costing too much. The original $2.6 billion estimated budget has increased five-fold to an incredible $14.6 billion. And the locals have been living in the construction site for nearly a decade. One community affected is the North End, Boston's historic Italian quarter. This is now the Big Dig's front line, and local resident Nancy Caruso has led the fight to make sure the community gets a fair deal. You know, engineers are, are funny people. Uh, you either mesh with them and they understand you and you can talk, 
or they're in their own world, and they're going to do it their way, even though they'll say to your face, oh, yes, I understand. The residents first met the construction team back in 1993. We had only one question that we want to resolve. No 24-hour construction, period. Our demand was simple, and it was really very reasonable, we thought. We want eight hours sleep. No noise between 11 o'clock at night and 7 in the morning. They didn't listen to us. It took us three years before we got their attention and they got religion. Realizing that they have to work with the community, the team bends over backwards to accommodate their wishes. But it's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, I can't deny this frustration, sure. Um, I mean, in your weaker moment, you say, gee, if they just close the city for a few years, you know, I'd, I'd get this in the ground and be done with it. This process, known as mitigation, has cost almost a third of the entire budget. We changed designs repeatedly um, in order to accommodate their needs. Now, did that have an effect on the cost of the project? Absolutely. The, the dollar cost to the agency goes up, but the total cost to society goes down because you're, you're cleaning up after yourself. You're not dumping these problems on others. In August 2002, as part of the mitigation process, the unfinished tunnel is open to 600,000 members of the public to walk through. It's the first time that the people of Boston can actually see what is being done under their city. By 2004, the Big Dig, one of America's largest and most technically challenging public works projects, is nearing completion. The eight-lane superhighway stretching under the city is now open to traffic, and it's being closely monitored 24 hours a day at the Operations Control Center. This state-of-the-art facility contains one of the most advanced electronic traffic monitoring systems in the world. Using more than 45,000 sensors and cameras, a team of 22 operators manage traffic, detect and respond to fires and accidents, maintain security and control ventilation, lighting and air quality throughout the entire system. From the moment you enter the tunnel, the minute you exit, they're watching. In the spring of 2004, the old six-lane double-deck bridge crossing the Charles River is demolished. For a year, it has been overshadowed by a new neighbor. The Leonard P. Zakim Bridge is now the crowning piece of the project and the gateway to Boston. The bridge's Y-shaped towers reach 270 feet high. The 116 cable stays holding up the 100,000 ton roadway suggest a ship in full sail to evoke Boston's connection with the sea. With 10 lanes of traffic, it is the widest cable stayed bridge in the world. And the public love it. It's been over 17 years since the Big Dig was first funded, and the project is nearing completion. But in this final hour, the team discover a serious flaw in the construction. By the summer of 2004, Construction of the Big Dig Tunnel is nearing completion. It has been over 17 years since the project's funding was first approved, and the team are nearly home and dry. But then, at 11.45 a.m. on September the 15th, 250 gallons of water a minute 
comes bursting through the wall of the northbound tunnel, 70 feet below ground in downtown Boston. I was actually in a meeting with engineering, the engineering managers, and we, we looked at each other and, and said, water coming to the, into the I-93 tunnel. We all know as engineers that the structure of the tunnel is very, very robust. Two of the highway lanes are cordoned off, and traffic backs up for miles while the team of engineers investigate. Initially, they think it's a burst water main or a fire hydrant. And the immediate thought was, is there a utility breach somewhere at the surface? Because no one would have thought in their mind that, that this was actually a leak in the wall. It's soon realized that the billion-dollar tunnel has developed a serious flaw. That evening, the team closed the tunnel and removed the tiled panel from the offending room. It's discovered that the huge pressure of groundwater has forced an eight-inch hole in the slurry wall, and it's flowing in fast. And at the equivalent of seven stories below street level, the groundwater pressure is immense. By nine o'clock that evening, a temporary patch has been forced into the hole and the flow diverted. I can tell you personally I'm outraged. I'm absolutely outraged. With the press and politicians baying for blood, public confidence in the big dig plummets, especially when it's discovered that the defect is a construction flaw in the slurry wall. You know, what we had in the breach panel of September 15th is when that slurry wall was actually constructed, some of the slurry mixture was trapped in the concrete mixture. There was a weakened section of concrete. The water pressure was able to, over time, work its way through this slurry and forced out a hole in the concrete wall of about eight inches in diameter. But if there is an imperfection in one slurry wall, how many other flaws might there be? Work is now ongoing to make sure there are no other hidden surprises. Just the disappointment of having a flaw manifest itself in such a, a disruptive way. It's an imperfect world. Um, you strive for perfection. Uh, you want everything to be right all the time. And uh, um, disappointment is really the key. By mid-2005, the team is still trying to swing public opinion, but it's an uphill struggle. To make matters worse, the state of Massachusetts allege poor construction management in some parts of the Big Dig. And federal prosecutors investigate allegations that the largest supplier of concrete to the project delivered substandard goods. The allegations are strongly denied. With the tunnel now open to traffic, the team start tearing down the aging and dirty elevated expressway that has cast a shadow over the city since the 1950s. The effect is immediate. I thought to myself, my God, look at the light. It is so bright. I had to go back home to get my sunglasses. It was that bright. And the air, the air smelled fresh and clean. In place of the elevated roadway will be 27 acres of tree-lined public parks, plazas, and open spaces. As a result, it's estimated that the city's carbon monoxide levels will drop by 12%. Even the dirt from the big dig is being put to a good cause. This is Granite Links Golf Course in Quincy, just eight miles south of Boston. Before the big dig, this was a disused landfill site. But over the last decade, 13 million tons of earth has been dumped here. That's up to 1,200 truckloads of dirt every day. Today, the 400-acre site has been landscaped into two semi-private professional golf courses. A 
It could never be argued that the Big Dig has been a cheap, quick fix to Boston's transportation problem. At an estimated final cost of $14.6 billion, the project will end up being more expensive to build than the Panama Canal and Hoover Dam combined. There are so many indicators out there by those who are truly in the city and use the infrastructure that this is a world of difference and it absolutely was worth it. It's been a tremendous team effort, that's probably the key. It's 20 years seems like a long time, but you look at what has gotten built and uh, it's been a terrific opportunity. But the Big Dig is unique. It has advanced our understanding of engineering and set a benchmark for how major urban construction projects of the future will be done. The last 13 years of tunneling through downtown Boston has transformed the city without a single home being destroyed.